right. So first of all, welcome to Van Q to our May meetup. Um, I'm Jocelyn, I'm one of the co-hosts for VanQ, uh, so thank you so much for everyone for joining. We're really excited for the presentation today with Larry Ng. Um, I'm just going to quickly pass it over to my colleague Shobit, who's just going to kind of take care of some housekeeping items, um, and then we'll get started. Uh, thanks so much, Jocelyn. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third VanQ webinar. For those of you who have joined us for the first time, uh, this is a meetup that we organize every month and we get speakers from uh, different backgrounds uh, who present on different topics. Uh, so for today, what I'll do is I'll quickly touch upon what we do first and then talk about some housekeeping rules since this may be the first thank you webinar for some of you and some of you I feel like may have been here the last time or a few times before this. So Optimus is basically a tech solutions company and uh, we help organizations in their digital transformation and we help them move to cloud. We offer a wide array of services like uh, cloud management, so things like cloud migration, architecture assessment, app development, and you can check more of our offerings on our website on what are the different areas that uh, we sort of specialize in. Uh, we are a Microsoft Gold certified partner with seven gold competencies and we use Microsoft Azure as our platform for any cloud integrations that we do. Uh, we have two centers of operation with, uh, we have one in Noida, New, uh, Noida, India, and the other one is of course in Vancouver with Vancouver being the headquarters. Uh, so now that you all know a little bit about Optimus, I'll move on to some of the housekeeping rules. So, Throughout, uh, uh, throughout the presentation, I'd request all of you to keep your mics on mute so that uh, it's easier to, for everyone to listen to Larry while he's presenting. And uh, since this is a webinar, we sort of want everyone to get to know each other a little bit. And you know, it would be great if everyone could post a short description. So things like your name, what do you do? What are you interested in? And who you're looking to connect with. So if you can provide your LinkedIn details as well, so in case anyone wants to connect with you, that would be great too. You can do that in the chat. And if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, you can either type it out in the chat and uh, Jesslyn or I can unmute you so you can ask your question and interact with Ari, uh, Larry that way. And that way it's also a bit more interactive. Or you can like raise your hand in the chat itself and we'll again unmute you. Um, what else? Uh, am I missing anything? No, I think, uh, yeah. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Larry, who's uh, presenting today. Uh, he is from Electronics, Electronic Arts and he's the development director there. And I'll pass on to Larry now. Thank you, Shobit. So now let me share my screen. You guys can see my screen okay, right? Okay, so um, uh, let's get started. Um, this session is uh, more about observability-driven development, and we just touched on a little bit about testing in production at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, one of the reasons why I picked uh, this topic is because um, in the last, I believe, at least two years, um, my current job and my last job, um, we, we emphasize a lot of, on observability, uh, observability, mainly because we, we now have a lot of um, loosely coupled uh, distributed systems with microservices and, and the whole cloud infrastructure. Uh, it becomes uh, very essential for us to, uh, uh, to know what's going on within our system. And without observability, uh, it's almost impossible for us to know what's going on. And if there are problems, uh, that's hard, really hard and time consuming to just try to debug something. So that's why I picked this topic. And I, I also saw some uh, practice that uh, it actually helped in, uh, in, in QA and in testing. So I try to uh, glue the two together and see if uh, that inspire us into doing um, uh, more observability, observability development to assist testing too.
Oops. Uh, okay, so we will talk about how to adopt uh, observability driven development methodology. Um, some of the tools that we will use and um, how do we instrument uh, our code and then how we consume the data. So um, this is um, a, a diagram that I always like to, to use to uh, almost uh, for every group that I need to present uh, the importance of our observability. On the right is everything Netflix has, everything. And on the left is maybe one dot here. So a system this complicated, how can you know what's going on in each piece when there are problems, let's say. Um, of course, every team may own just one, one small piece of the, uh, the system. But even within the smaller one, the more, more simple one over here, um, things are flowing through many, many different places. So how do you know what's going on in each piece without uh, uh, any observability in it? So um, that triggered us uh, in the industry even to uh, emphasize on the importance of observability driven development. And well, this is just an example, uh, one of the uh, smaller systems within EA that we use to uh, collect game data, telemetry, and things like that. So again, there are so many different pieces. If um, there are things not working or there are data missing, we, um, we need uh, a lot of data or uh, metrics and trace to find out what's wrong. So what exactly is observability? Uh, a lot of us would know uh, about monitoring a system. Um, so you, you have the typical traditional dashboard showing um, uh, CPUs of the server memory usage, um, um, maybe DB logs even. So those are just monitoring. Um, you it allow us to, to know what's going, on, what's going on, what's working. Uh, when it's not working, it will show you, but it usually is too late. Uh, you, um, when, when let's say you, you have monitoring on um, um, a server response time or something like that, when it becomes so slow, it will trigger an alarm, but at that point it's already too late. So in, in nature, it's quite reactive. Um, if we have observability, it allows us to, to gain more insight into uh, the system real time. Uh, we can do a lot more, uh, uh, let's say artificial uh, uh, triggering errors or uh, injecting different types of data from uh, upstream and see how it, uh, how it transform in the downstream. Do you get um, uh, the result that you need? How's your doctor images uh, spinning up? Uh, is your auto, auto scaling working well? Things like that. So we gain a lot of insight when we have observability built into our system. Um, it, you can think of it as uh, a tool at the, be at the beginning because um, from, from an end user's perspective, especially from, uh, from let's say uh, the QA or QE group, um, you usually just worry about looking at the dashboard. So it's a dashboard, so it's a tool. Uh, but in, uh, in reality, it's a methodology, it's almost like how you, how you define your uh, test-driven development, how you start your process, how you, how you ensure that you have uh, observa observability built into your uh, your development process as acceptance criteria, things like that. So it's it's more like an, a methodology than just a tool. And uh, this is just to um, reflect on my point previously about monitoring. Okay, typically you monitor CPU usage, uh, maybe how much traffic inbound, outbound, things like that. So it doesn't really tell you much. It's uh, uh, basically for for an IT or DevOps person to know the general health of the system. But you, you don't really know what's going on in the system from one place to another, from one component to another. So why, why, do, why do we think it matters? Um, like I mentioned before, because systems are more uh, loosely coupled and uh, it's distributed and uh, we make changes on every little thing all the time. Uh, every team is working on multiple things, on multiple components, committing code and, and, um, uh, and making new libraries or even using third party libraries. We uh, spin up new instances. Uh, we initiate new, um, new microservices. So we uh, change changes nonstop every day, all the time on all the environment. So uh, with observability, we at least will know that, um, okay, what's new? Uh, maybe um, another team spins up uh, another five instances for no reason. And now we know, then we can ask the, uh, the teams why, why you're using that many resources, things like that. So um, 
in a way, when we have all the all these metrics and logs and 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 traces incorporated into the system in our code, um, we we can look at the patterns uh, on a normal uh, normal usage at peak usage, and we can predict um, failures. We can predict what can go wrong uh, by just looking at. In fact, some of the tools have machine learning to help us to um, um, to find out or at least predict what's going to happen. Uh, at certain day of the uh, certain time of the day or certain days of the week, and uh, a lot. Uh, in fact, I think not a lot. Uh, almost 99% of the the software that we build, we we process data from one place to another. Um, doesn't matter how much testing we do with uh, all these data schema, the data format. Um, there are always problems with data, um, especially on the context. Uh, all the data can go through all the ETL process to from one system to another. They can be correct, uh, but in context, they could be wrong. So uh, uh, with observability, it, it uh, helps us or at least gives us an insight on uh, catching those anomalies. And uh, of course, we can track those anomalies and, and, the, uh, and the system can learn, okay, when, when next time we see some, some data like that, it could be a problem. Am I going too fast? Uh, any questions so far? Anyone has any comments, questions? Okay, so let's move on. So, yeah, uh, we know what observability is now. Then uh, what is observability driven testing, uh, driven development? Almost like we know what testing is, but what is test, uh, testing driven development? Uh, it's a mindset. So we influence the whole uh, development team and QA team to know that, okay, this is important. Now we need to make sure that when we design uh, our system, when we design our code, uh, we have to instrument the code at the right place to uh, produce the right uh, data, the, the right logs, the right metrics. Um, obviously, uh, uh, we can instrument our code to speed out logs to, uh, everywhere, uh, verbals, everything. But um, uh, that could be a bit too much. So um, uh, almost like when, when we ask people to do unit tests, they can write a ton of uh, useless unit tests. So the, uh, when we have the observability-driven development mindset, it, it basically means that imagine yourself as someone who has to support what you build, uh, be it an internal system or a, a production system serving many, many end users. Imagine you are that person supporting that uh, that system, and 3 a.m. in the morning, um, your your page of duty uh, sends you a message, and you have to wake up and try to figure out what's wrong. So if you have that mindset, then when you are actually building the system, you know what I should include uh, in in my log, in my trace, in my metrics, to uh, let pe people know, let myself know, or let people know that okay, um, um, you can start by troubleshooting where because uh, it could be something wrong in in which place. So uh, observability is almost like a, uh, a tool to help people. And uh, it's first step really for helping uh, people to know what's going on in the system so they can troubleshoot and, and find a, a solution to problems. Um, and um, of course, code instrumentation is uh, a big piece of uh, observability. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, teams, especially on the QA or QE side, they, we don't really do uh, code instrumentation. Uh, that usually is a developer's job, but as, um, as part of an, a development team or part of an engineering team, uh, just like how, how QA used to or is still doing uh, on, on gating the quality of the code or quality of a feature, you, if now you know everyone has to um, have the observability-driven development mindset, then uh, it becomes part of your uh, systems criteria. So when, when the feature is done, you would also ask the question, uh, is observability instrumented? Uh, do I see a dashboard to show something about that, uh, that component or that feature? Uh, with all those uh, uh, instrumentation done, you can then, of course, create all these charts and alerts and notifications and whatnot, uh, and maybe even machine learning depends on um, uh, which tool you're using. Some of the, I didn't touch, really touch on um, uh, different tools because um, there are so many out there, but I can, I can name um, maybe one or two uh, that are more, more popular. Uh, um, the 
first one would be uh, an open source one. We call that the ELK stack. It's from Elastic. So why does it call LELK? Is because you use Elasticsearch with uh, Logstash and the Kibana dashboard to to help with uh, building your observability dashboard and backend. And the other one is uh, quite obvious is Splunk, but it's a commercial tool. Uh, it comes with um, some of the nice feature like machine learning things built in. So um, what, what should be instrumented? Um, you see the three, three words there, traces, metrics, and logs. Um, some people actually call that the three pillars of observability. Um, so uh, you instrument your code to, um, uh, to allow uh, the tracing of data from one place to another. So uh, apparently you're, you're working in a, a larger uh, software system. Um, you can be a data provider. You can also be a data consumer. There are upstream systems, there are other downstream systems. So you, you want to make sure that you can you create the traces of the data that you are processing. Um, of course, with uh, all these unique IDs and metadata or whatnot. So uh, when you are done inside your, your component, when you're done with processing those data, when you pass it on to your downstream component or downstream systems, uh, they continue on tacking onto um, um, that piece of info. So uh, at the end in the dashboard, we know exactly uh, every single piece of data, when they go to, uh, from where to where and what happened to it. So uh, those are the traces that we are talking about. Uh, and of course, you can also have metrics like your, uh, the processing time uh, with all these timestamps, start time, end time, and whatnot. And your log files is just a general console output. It can be standard out re really. Um, a, lot of, a lot of developers are already doing it. They just uh, standard out a lot of things when, so that when they want to uh, debug, they, they, can, they get to see the log uh, uh, in the console. So uh, those three are considered the three pillars of observability. Um, and yeah, we still use the word monitor because at the end you still get the dashboard, even though it, uh, it's monitoring, but it does provide you a lot of uh, intelligent insight. So uh, the typical ones are health, uh, status, performance, usage, uh, patterns, things like that. Those are the things that we monitor with observability dashboard. Um, and uh, with those monitoring and, uh, and, and metrics and, and, uh, and data, uh, it, it, you can translate them into uh, these KPIs, SLIs, SLOs. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of that. I assume all the software sur surfacing internal or external team, we, we do adhere to a lot of these AP, uh, KPIs or SLIs, surface level indicator, things like that. Um, so we will translate a lot of the metrics and, and data collected from observability to, uh, to these um, three letter acronyms. Uh, I forgot where that, I uh, maybe uh, in change of order. I, I, there's another uh, observability dashboard that I will show in the like, upcoming slides. Um, we touched on traces. So traces, like I mentioned, uh, it's uh, um, all the data coming and going from one place to another. So uh, we already touched on, they, they need to have the unique ID, they need to have timestamps, which service is uh, processing the data. We keep adding on to, um, that uh, normally we will use a JSON, uh, JSON object or JSON document to capture all this. So going from one place to another, uh, we'll keep adding on the info so we can process them later. Yeah, the metrics part is uh, really for, for the visualization and analytics. So um, throughput, utilization, these are basically metrics. It's not just a, a, a singleton. So because you, you have to calculate your throughput, you calculate your utilization. Um, either in, you instrument that in the code or some of them actually come uh, uh, built in, in your dashboard. So you can uh, just like uh, as simple as your, your memory or CPU utilization, um, your traffic throughput, your API traffic throughput, your API usage, things like that. So they, uh, some of them you don't, absolutely need to instrument your code with, uh, but uh, it's uh, in practice. So we, we have to be uh, uh, almost like a gatekeeper. If uh, we don't get them uh, out of the box, then we should make sure that we, we instrument our, our code or component to, to produce those metrics. Locks is basically the sim simplest one. Uh, if 
you, you just started looking at implementing observability into your, your system uh, and you don't know where to start, logs would always be the first one because um, it's most likely already be, be in the code. So you don't need to refactor a lot to instrument your code because your developers most likely will have a lot of those logs in different places already. So a, an example, uh, a, an observability dashboard. So instead of just looking at uh, system health, CPU utilization, memory usage, throughput, uh, DBIO, things like that. Now we have <coughs> uh, more metrics. So it could be uh, tracking error rate. It could be tracking um, your, your load balancer, your DLB elastic load balancer request. Um, it can have lambda execution time. It can have uh, some latency. Um, of course, how many how many logs are getting written? Uh, how many are, are warnings? How many are, are errors? So you, you get a much uh, uh, a richer um, a dashboard to to um, gain more insight into what's going on in your system. They're always colorful and nice looking. So now uh, after you instrument your code, you have all these observ observability um, uh, mindset and uh, engineering practice. What, what's next? So you, you of course we create uh, your initial dashboard to show, okay, what, what do I not know before and I, I get to know now because I've done all these observability instrumentation. So starting with uh, something simple and then uh, uh, you can keep improving on your, on your, uh, your dashboard or even uh, you get to know, okay, I may have instrumented uh, at the wrong place or instrumented the wrong info. So you keep improving on it. It's, um, it's an ongoing exercise. So you don't, you don't just create a, uh, create a dashboard and then forget about it and every day just uh, have a glimpse of it on a TV screen and okay, yeah, it seems okay and I don't care. So your um, observability driven development is you, you keep improving on it so that uh, eventually you have 100% insight into your system because it uh, doesn't matter how, how, how much time you, you spend or invest on uh, implementing observability in your system. Um, you, you'll miss something because you also develop uh, new things on, on top of your system. So uh, you keep learning from it. You, you keep instrumenting new things. You keep uh, uh, capturing new metrics. Um, the end goal is to, to really get 100% insight into what's going on in your system. Like I said before, it, if uh, you are someone um, uh, supporting it uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, the most ideal case is you look at the dashboard, you drill down a little bit, you know of what's wrong within minutes and you know exactly how to resolve it. That is definitely our end goal here. So this is another type of dashboard. It tells you more about um, uh, your app performance. Uh, even your uh, infrastructure performance. So you have all these availability zone, definitely a, a AWS um, stack right here. So all these uh, AZ CPU usage from all your instances. Um, and then you translate that to, to SLO and SLAs. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing what, what, what you can get from uh, this dashboard with proper observability in place. Okay, so now let's say we have, uh, we have done enough in, in observability. So how, how does it help testing really? Um, I know um, everyone has been telling me that uh, the word testing in production is quite controversial, but um, I, know, I, know, I know most of us in QA and, and testing, um, at some point in time, we, we test in production without knowing it or without acknowledging it. Uh, we, we basically test in production a lot. So um, why, why is observability important uh, for, for testing in production? Um, part of the reason is because, um, uh, let's say we, we practice the whole test pyramid. We, we shift lab testing. We, we do a good job in unit testing, integration testing, uh, contract testing, all these API layers, at, uh, and we, we spend little effort uh, uh, testing the UI. Um, it's all good. So now you deploy to staging. And we always thought that our staging is the same as production or close to production. That's what we were told for the longest time. 
but I bet it that your staging is never really close to production. Uh, you always have bugs that you, you can find in production, which can, you cannot reproduce in staging. So uh, that is part of the reason that um, uh, testing production has some value. Uh, we still need to do everything, uh, all, all the traditional, I, I have another slide to show you um, what, what are the, uh, the usual testing that we do pre-production. Uh, now we're talking about the post-production testing. So with observability in place, because most of the observability uh, tools and, and code instrumentation are on production anyway. So uh, what we have observability in production, then we can orchestrate some carefully, some test um, uh, to, to understand more how, how the full system is work. Um, some of them as interesting as chaos testing, like pulling a note, uh, uh, pulling a note out or even shutting down some node or injecting some very uh, interestingly malformed data, things like that with observability that, that help us to, um, to learn more about uh, the, how, how resilient our systems are. So I borrowed this diagram from another website. Um, this is all the pre-production testing that we have been doing throughout our career. All these functional tests, regression tests, contract tests, smoke tests, UI tests. We are definitely familiar with all of these. Um, but now in production, there are multiple stages of post-production uh, that's going on from deploy to release to post-release. Some of these tests we actually do without knowing that we are, we are testing production. Um, some people actually do, do a bit of low test on production. I, I, I myself uh, is one of those offenders. We keep telling people that we do low tests on, on staging or, or in another test environment but since they're never at the same scale as production. So we uh, I usually ask my team to find a quiet time or, or downtime um, and, and do a little bit of low test on production. We do that. So test is definitely another one. Um, uh, a lot of system or software, we, we want to, to run some soap test, meaning that, okay, let it run in production. Uh, start uh, letting production data to flow in and see how it goes. So we have been doing this. So uh, even though it's a, a controversial uh, topic, but I, I believe a lot of team are actually doing it. And with all these modern DevOps and whatnot, um, been doing blue green de deployment, canary, they, they are testing in a way because you, you slowly uh, deployed um, uh, your, your code to, uh, to your production system uh, in different stages and you run more, uh, because I assume all these canary and blue green deployment, they're also part of CI/CD. So when, when, um, when you slowly deploy it to your production environment, they have to pass CI/CD, and those are testing too. Uh, and of course, post-release, uh, the chaos testing, pulling up down, or or A/B testing, and those are uh, definitely a production testing uh, uh, methodology that a lot of a lot of team and a lot of companies have been doing many many years. And I guess that is the end of my, my presentation. And now I would like to open up the floor for uh, more interactions and questions. Uh, does anyone have a question? Feel free to you know, type it in the chat here and we can unmute you. Has anyone had any experience, um, experience with um, observation-driven development and testing? Is this a, a brand new term to you or you have read about it, heard about it, and talked about it with your team somehow? You guys are awfully quiet today. No, everyone's so shy. Uh, I don't know where to chat it or do I? Um, uh, someone so says it's a we new have term. a person saying it's a new term, new term. So I'm just going to unmute Nella and Nell. 
You can ask your question to Larry here. Oops. Go ahead, you're muted. Sure, uh, hi Larry, uh, thanks for this presentation. Um, my question is uh, around the proportionality of uh, how many how many effort is being spent in 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 software development efforts say when the developer will write their code against those QAs who will go through the process of testing um I think the it's a culture it's a culture shift um i I've been doing um I don't know if you guys know my background. I, I'm actually in QA for, for many, many years. Until recently, I, I got transitioned into more a development role. Um, it has been a culture shift for at least three, four years. Um, when we talk about the, the test pyramid or shift left testing, um, um, a lot of um, say the unit test, integration test, or even sometimes the, the, the contract tests are done by the developers. So. Um, and um, traditional Q, QA team would um, still be more focusing on automating end-to-end uh, -end or UI test. But uh, the, the culture shift have started at least three to four years ago uh, when uh, a lot of the quality engineer, uh, we call it quality engineers. Um, so they, they don't just automate uh, manual test on the front end or, 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 or do end-to-end -end automation. They, they actually are quite involved into writing um, the integration test, the contract test, or whatnot. Um, maybe not so much with unit tests, but um, that is more really, I think, it, uh, we, where we draw the line. Uh, the developers are going to write the unit test for their code. Uh, but QA or, or QE now actually owns a lot more um, testing uh, on the left side or on the bottom of the test pyramid. So um, I can't really name a, a recommended percentage. Um, so it, it, I'm not sure if I answer your question or. Um, I understand it. Uh, yeah, Th thanks for, I, I think I got what you mean. Thanks for answering. But for, for uh, observability is uh, most likely a, a development job still because um, it, it's a lot about instrumenting the code when, when they are writing code during development. So, um, um, but it's a mindset too, because when the whole team, like a Scrum team, if we, we care about observability, then we will have uh, a task or a story to, to make sure that any new feature are, are, are instrumented with observability in mind. And the QA folks will, will definitely check on it. Okay, when it's instrumented, then I should be able to see that on the dashboard um, before it, it can actually say that it's done or actually deploy that to production. So uh, just a follow one more question, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so for a team that doesn't have the concept of observability, say for example, they have manual testing and the usual automation testing using U uh, UI and I have this idea of uh, observability testing. How should I, how can I start selling or <laughs> the, the convincing should be easy. Like if you don't have any observability in place, I am assuming that um, the, the software that your team is building is um, not a simple website, right? It, uh, assuming that it's uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, if you don't have any observability in place, um, how, how do they debug? Like when you find a when you when right through testing, let's say, or even from from the field from uh, end users, it will take quite a, quite a lot quite a lot of time to try to try to debug something. You you may know how to reproduce it, um, and then the developers have to know uh, which part of the code got executed and uh, why why the repro step will 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 actually work in in my code. So it, it it's a very time consuming exercise. Uh, but with observability in place, um, you may not even need to reproduce a problem because mm -hmm. you should be able to see the problem right away. So you don't need a QA person to to uh, lock a ticket. Uh, okay, these uh, step one, do this step two, go through 20 steps uh, to, to try to reproduce a problem because you, you can just pinpoint on that even just a, a time frame. Okay, in, um, uh, two hours ago at, at, at um, uh, 4th of 4.35 p.m., 
I, I was doing this and I found this problem. And if you look at the dashboard, uh, everyone will know what's, what's, going, what's going on at that, at that snapshot in time. Um, if you have, let's say even your, your data, your, your, your traces, you know what you were doing with one piece of data and you can trace it through the whole, uh, the whole system at that time uh, a snapshot. It helps everyone to be able to, to troubleshoot and debug a problem and, and um, you get the quicker, quickest feedback. You don't need um, to run a ton of tests again to, uh, to see if you can uh, uh, reproduce a problem. And, um, and after they fix it, you almost see that in the dashboard wide array too. Thanks. Is there any other questions? I know a lot of people in the chat have said this is, you know, a pretty new term to them. So hmm. is there anything that needed um, some clarification or is there anyone in the group that maybe has heard of this term before or, you know, has any experience with it they would like to share? Yeah, th thanks. Um, yeah, just a comment. So I don't know what's, what are the essential skills for this uh, kind of approach, say, when the automation comes in, hey, here comes the uh, Selenium automation developer, then what about the um, observable approach? What's the skills of will be on um, I, I mentioned about um, a tool, popular tools, um, the ELK step, the ELK, and Splunk. Okay. So they, they, are, they are tools, but they don't work out of the box. Because imagine you, uh, for, for your team, you may be using Python or, or Node.js to write your applications. Um, some other team may actually use C Sharp. Uh, another team may be using Ruby. So um, uh, at, at the instrumentation point, um, the tools w uh, will still require you to have the uh, proficiency in your in your language to be able to instrument your code. Right. Um, without instrumenting the code, there's nothing you're collecting. Your lock is not shipping anywhere. Mm -hmm. Your traces are not shipping to any systems. You cannot even create the dashboard. So, uh, unlike most of um, uh, the more technical side of testing, that okay, we can pick up a tool, we can pick up a framework, we can learn about. Uh, uh, even Postman or, or and how to use Newman to, to run uh, Postman test. Um, those are uh, pretty straightforward for most of the Q, QA or QE, QE teams. Uh, when it comes to in, uh, instrumenting the code for observability, uh, that's why I, I said that it's still uh, quite a, a developer job because mm -hmm. they know their code, they know the language and um, they, it's, it, it's easy at that point because when, when you know the language, you know your code base, uh, instrumenting your code is as simple as importing a library and then, and then make sure you, you instrument that at the right place. Uh, and all these tools will support uh, different, different types of languages. Uh, it, it's hard, like, um, I, I wouldn't expect a hardcore a QA or QE engineer to, to be able to do that or we want to do that. Uh, if I, I, if I say that, it's literally like me asking QE or QA to uh, go directly and write the unit test for the developers. Thank you. I know maybe it, uh, observability is a new, new terminology for, for a lot of people, but do you see uh, or at least uh, um, find something similar as a practice that your, your team is exercising? Uh, you don't call that observability, but you are collecting these traces or logs, and you have some dashboard to to understand what your system is doing. Were there any other questions at all? Great. That means it's time to, to pick up something new and learn. All of us uh, are learning something new now. Like if it's done everywhere, then why do we need to talk about it? All right, if there's no other questions, they're gonna sign off. But if anyone has any kind of follow-up questions about the topic, about testing in general, just because you know Larry is 
super experienced and has a wealth of knowledge. Um, um, just uh, one more thing. Uh, I'm the only one asking questions. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what's, what are the common pitfalls for this? Say, for example, okay, this is a new team. Okay, we attended this. And then we, we've been working on this for two weeks, three weeks. And then after three weeks, there's something wrong. <laughs> Something's wrong with what we're doing for sure. What what are typical pitfalls? Uh, pitfalls. I don't quite quite catch it. So so for for to... a new team that tries to adapt to this me, um, method of uh, mm -hmm, process uh, um, observability, what are common pitfalls for a new team like a uh, rookie mistakes or Begin beginners. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I think I, I let me let me think of some examples. Um, I can use traces as an example. Um, traces is something I um, in the slide I mentioned that you you want to uh, um, instrument uh, your code so that um, you can identify the data going through from from upstream to downstream um, uh, what what um, uh, what what's the start time what's the end time for each component and the component name and the unique ID so um, on the surface it seems, it seems quite a simple exercise uh, once the team agreed on um, uh, the data format the data schema they and uh, how they generate um, this unique ID um, then every every team will just go about doing their own thing, and at the end we'll uh, we'll just see how it how it looks like in the dashboard. Um, one one thing one mistake that uh, one of my teams did before uh, when they started doing the observability, observability is they forgot that uh, we didn't really standardize on um, uh, uh, time uh, which which time format to use. Mm. Um, uh, as bad as it sounds, some team is using UTC, some team is actually using uh, PST. So when they lock the timestamps, they, they're different. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the dashboard, uh, you will see that, okay, it doesn't make sense because uh, I know that the data should flow through from point A to point B, but how come uh, I, now in the, in the dashboard, I see the data actually arrive at point B first. So um, um, those are the things to keep, uh, to keep in mind and consider when you are working with, especially when you're working uh, in a more distributed system uh, environment with many teams, uh, only different, type, different parts of the system. Uh, some level of standardization is still needed to, to make sure that the, um, uh, all these observability components are, are inconsistent. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? All right, if not, then I guess we'll just quickly wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much, Larry, for presenting today to Van Q. Um, it sounds like it was a really new topic for most people. So that's, you know, definitely really great that you were able to come and speak about that. Um, and then Shobi, did you have any kind of last minute wrap up things? Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I just uh, wanted to, again, take the time to thank Larry for, you know, uh, despite his busy schedule, making the time for uh, presenting at our VanQ webinar today and uh, thank all the participants who joined us. I'm sure, uh, as Jocelyn, you mentioned, and a lot of participants mentioned that this is a new topic, so I'm sure it's like a great learning, learning point for everyone. Uh, just a quick note that we'll have another VanQ meetup next month. It is going to be on June 25th, and we'll have Robert uh, from Teutonic uh, Labs presenting uh, on June 25th. So if you guys go on to our meetup page, you can RSVP there and the topic uh, will be posted closer to the date and more details will follow soon. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it from my end. Great, thank you everyone. Um, thank and you then everyone. we will hopefully see all of you next month.
Great. Good night. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.